Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, there's no problems on it. So if you just want to keep it as uh, for information, and it, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to it, but it, it's not nearly as important as the rest of the stuff we're going to cover. And you'll be happy to know that I cut this handout down by 10 pages. You used to go up to 28 pages, which, um, you know, a bit much. Okay, uh, investment categories. It makes a big difference in how you account for investments, depending on which category they're in. And we basically are looking at uh, two different types of securities for the most part, debt securities and equity securities. Debt securities are like when you buy bonds. So if you buy bonds, they'll pay a certain interest rate, or maybe you buy um, a US government note or something like that. There's something that pays an interest rate, and at some point in time, they pay the rest of it back to you. Debt securities are usually fairly secure, not always, but usually, and they are, um, and, and because of that, they don't vary in value too much. They they might vary some. They vary based on interest rates, but interest rates are you know they they generally don't change too much. Two or three percent is about what they change at, at most. So, um, investing in bonds is is really a a lower risk and a lower return, which is what you expect <clears throat> uh, compared to investing in stocks. So, equity securities are when you someone invests in stocks. Uh, stocks are ownership. And a stock price may go up a lot based on what the company's doing, or it may go down a lot based on what the company's doing. And how we account for those makes a big difference. Okay. Now, there are two different types of losses that we run into when it comes to investments. Realized ones, and that's done when the investment is sold. And unrealized ones. This is when the investment is not sold, but the market value of the investment has changed at year end. All right, so realized when you sell it, unrealized is when you haven't sold it, but the market value of it has changed. So for this first one, you know, you buy stock for $100 and you sell it for whatever, $110, and you'll have a gain of $10, right? You bought it for $100, sold for $110. This unrealized gains and losses means that you can have a loss even if you don't sell it or a gain if you even if you don't sell it. So you'd have, let's say you buy stock for $500 and at the end of the year it's worth $520. You'll have a gain. It's going to be an unrealized gain because you actually didn't sell it. There was no cash involved. So the stock was not sold, but the value of it has changed. So realized means you sold it. Unrealized means you didn't sell it, but the value has changed. So there's no cash coming in for unrealized gains. Realized gains, there'll be cash coming in. Even if there's a loss, there'll be cash coming in usually. But um, the unrealized ones, there's no cash coming in. They, they It hasn't really happened yet. You haven't actually sold the stock. Okay, question there. All right, different types of securities. Debt securities and equity securities. So let me just talk about this. That ones are usually bonds.
And debt securities have possible investment categories held to maturity. Means that you hold it for the entire life. So if you have a 10 year bond, So example of that would be a 10 year bond held for 10 years. That would be a held to maturity. These next two categories, we're not gonna talk about too much right now. I'll talk a little bit about them later, but uh, if they're deemed to be a trading security or available for sale security. Uh, it depends on which one they are as to where the unrealized gain or loss goes to. Trading securities go to income, available for sale goes to comprehensive income. So this one's net income, this one's comprehensive income. Um, it's kind of funny, they eliminated those the separation of those two categories for equity stock, but they didn't change it for the um, debt securities. And I'm not sure why, but it, it's a kind of a quirk. Uh, but anyway, that's what the last three pages of this handout are about. You know, there's a lot of work involved in it for very little, because like I say, it's not not testing tremendously on the TBA here. You might get a multiple choice question or something on it, but for the most part, it's not that, um, for the amount of work, it's not uh, usually worth it. Okay, and so this is basically when you're lending money to somebody. You're lending money to the government, uh, you know, a treasury bond, or you're lending money to another company, you're buying bonds of IBM. Equity securities are ownership. How much of it do you own? And these are a little bit more complex, and these are what we're gonna spend more time on. Um, and we basically have three investment categories for the equity securities. Now, these are the true criteria for each of these. The second ones here kind of came into play um, Through an, through an odd, an odd, kind of an odd thing that happened. All right, so fair value method. If they are not influential, they use the fair value method. If they're influential, they use the equity method. And if they control the company, uh, then we have to do consolidations where you consolidate, you take the two financial statements and switch them together. Okay, so, so the fair value method, if it's, if you're non-influential, you can't influence a company. So if I, let's say I buy a hundred shares of IBM stock, I'm not influential. IBM doesn't even know I have them probably. Um, and, you know, that amount of stock isn't going, while well, it still is ownership, and I still, I still get to vote. Uh, I don't have enough votes that I'm probably influential. And you get up to the next one where you're influential, that's when you usually have a substantial amount in the company. You know, whatever percentage that is depends on the kind of company it is. But, um, you know, as you get more influential, we account for something and we account for it in a different way. And then consolidations happen when you own more than 50% of the company. You control the company. And in that case, we do what they call cons consolidations. We take the two companies and we smush them together. You guys will do that in um, advanced accounting. So in advanced accounting, we'll talk about how you take two companies and you know, we smush them together. There's, there's a little more involved in that. But, uh, but, you know, so if there's a company that owns five companies, uh, you know, controls five companies, all five of those companies will get combined into one financial statement. You'll have what they call a consolidated financial statement. And you'll see this. If you look at a big company's financial statements, 
look at like Ford, they'll have a Ford set of financial statements, and then they'll have a consolidated set of financial statements. That okay, here's the Ford company, but then here's Ford with all of the investments, all the consolidated companies that they own will all be put together. You know that this is this is what they really control. They control all these other companies and all these other assets. Okay, so it goes by non-influential to influential to controlling. So here's the weird thing. And this is one of those weird things that happens with US accounting rules versus the rest of the world. The rest of the world is very comfortable with those kind of vague terms, non-influential, influential. The United States, they put out um, some examples for people to know how to implement this. And the examples were that if it was under 20% that of ownership, that it was non-influential. And in the examples, they, 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 they just gave examples. They didn't give, you know, any of them. And then if it was over 20%, they called, they said it was influential. In the examples they gave, again, these are not necessarily the hard rules. These are, you know, just kind of they were giving examples of how of how people should use these as far as determining what's influential and what's not. The US uh, companies took that as if you if you don't know whether it's influential or not, you go by the percentages. So if it's zero to twenty percent, it's not influential. If it's twenty to fifty percent, it's influential. But that's only if you don't know, if they don't come out and say whether it's influential or not. Okay. So we're, we're going to kind of see how these rules kind of play out. But so if you, you first see if, the, if there's indications of whether it is non influential or influential, if they don't tell you that, then you go to rules number two. And here's the number, rules number two. So let's say they don't tell you whether it's influential or not. Uh, hopefully they give you the ownership because that's the only other way you're going to determine it. And if it has these amounts of ownership, then you use that. So the first rules are here. If you don't know those rules, then over here is the uh, kind of the second best. So second best, you go to the percentage of ownership. All right. So we're going to go through here and kind of classify these. And I think I got to go back here to this number first one to talk a little bit about the um, trading securities versus the available for sale. Uh, I'm going to copy this down. Trading securities may be sold at any time. So they're more immediate. And these are current assets. Available for held securities will be held for a longer period of time. It's 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 vague, but usually a lot of times it'd be more than a year, but not always. And those could be current or long-term assets, but they're held for a longer period of time. So trading securities are, are securities that could be. Uh, sold at any time, any any moment, they could be sold. Whereas available for sale are held for a longer period of time, oftentimes over a year, but not always. And these could be current assets or long-term assets. 
Okay. So let's go to the debt security. So this is kind of the wacky one. So debt securities purchase a five year treasury bond as an investment. Management tells, intends to hold this investment for two years. So which type of security is this? Anyone? Would it be available for sale? Yep. Very good. Yeah, this is available for sale one. It's it's not trading. A trading one could be sold. At, a trading one they may even have a you know a selling price on it. If this if the stock hits fifty dollars, we're gonna sell it. Um. So yeah, this is gonna be available for sale. Hey, what happened? And again, two years, it's not gonna be a trading security. Trading securities are very short term. And they may even have a sales order in for them already. Um, yeah, so this will be a, an available for sale. Okay, purchase five-year treasury bond as an investment. Management tends to hold this investment for the entire five-year life. Held to maturity. Yep. Something wrong here. What do I do? Yep, held to maturity. So you're going to hold it the entire time, and you have it as a held to maturity. Yeah. Purchase a five-year treasury bond as an investment. Management intends to sell this investment within the next month. And I know these are kind of non-descriptive terms, but this one would be what? It could be a trading. So if they can be sold at any time, it's a trading security. <laughs> now the equity securities are what we're gonna concentrate more on for this chapter. We're not gonna do too much with these, the debt securities. The equity securities we're gonna do more of, and the reason why we're gonna do more of these debt securities, they're, they're by far and away the more, um, well, for, for one thing, more interesting of them, but also the, um, they're uh, more common for investments. Okay. Equity securities purchased a hundred or excuse me, a thousand shares of General Motors stock as an investment. Management intends to hold this investment forever. The question is, well, first of all, General Motors, I'm sure, has millions of shares of stock. So this thousand shares, would this be non-influential, influential or controlling? Right, non-influential. Yeah, non-influential. So and let me go ahead and write that. So this would be not influential. It's a lot of shares, but the company is so big, uh, it probably wouldn't have any effect on it. Okay, uh, purchased a thousand shares of General Motors as, as an investment. Management tends to hold this investment for three years. We 
which method? Would it still be the fair value? Yep. Yeah, it's still going to be non influential. And it's going to be fair value. And the last one. Guy <laughs> who's buried in Grant's tomb. Versus a thousand shares of general motor stock investment, management tends to sell the stock to fund next month's payroll. And you probably have guessed it, it's still fair value. So notice the amount of time that you hold it does not have any impact on equity securities, where it does on debt securities. On debt securities, how long you plan on holding it makes a difference. Equity securities, not so. You know, whether you're going to hold on to it forever or for next month, it doesn't matter. It's not influential. Yeah. Uh, so not influential, it's not influential. It'll be fair value method. I know what you're thinking. Hey, let's do more debt security or equity securities. Okay. <clears throat> Purchase 25% of LiveGo stock as an investment. Management intends to hold this investment for at least three years. Equity method? Yep. Yeah, they, they didn't tell you whether they're influential or not. So we don't have any of those. However, we go to our second best, and it is between 20 and 50, so it'll be the equity method. Uh, purchase 25% of five go stock. The investment management tends to hold this for at least three years. Okay, here's the twist. 75% of the stock is held by the founder of LiveGo. Would it still be the equity method? Or would you consolidate it considering there's only two? Well, well, here's the thing. The owner of the, you know, the live go would um would definitely consolidate it because they have more to say more than 50%. But the question is, are you influential anymore? Um there's another shareholder out there that could outvote you every just do. There's another shareholder out there that can outvote you on everything. So it really depends on how much input you have in the place. But you could there, this one, if unless there's anything else involved, would probably be a fair value because you, again, you really are not, you may not be influential because of if there's one other entity that is holding all the cards, um, whatever you want to do may not be listened to. It's hard to say with just this information because you know it depends on how you're going on the board of directors and all that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, and generally speaking, if you have someone on the board of directors, it's influential. Yeah, you know, it depends on where they have even have a board of directors. But um, so it does make a difference as far as what what other people own other shares of the stock, whether it's influential or not. It could be equity method. You know, like I say, if they have someone on the board of directors. Very well could be equity method if they have a board of directors. Nine, purchase 60% of the outstanding stock.
Which method? Consolidation. Yep. Yep. If you have more than 50%, you consolidate the financial statements. Uh, by the way, just as a side note, you actually use the equity method when you do consolidation. So these two kind of are similar. They use a similar method um, when they when they do it. The equity method, though, if it's less than 50%, you don't combine the financial statements. Okay. Purchase 10% of the outstanding shares of General Motors. Um, blah, blah, blah. Management intends to hold the investment for two years. That doesn't matter. Management has two officials on the board of directors, General Motors. So this would be the equity method since they, you have. Yep. Very good. Yeah, you're influential. And that's one thing about, you know, a large company, 10% would easily be influential. Um, there are there have been cases where investors with, uh, you know, 10% of the shares of ousted CEOs and stuff. So, um, you know, 10% is quite a bit for publicly traded companies. You know, smaller companies, that it may not be that big. But, you know, in large companies, you know, in larger companies, it may be worth, 40 or 50 billion, you know, so an investment of 10% might be four or five billion dollars. Okay. Uh, purchase 3% of the outstanding shares of Ford. But only acquired 4% of the voting rights. And it intends to hold this for seven years. So they bought 30% of the shares, but they only have 4% of the voting rights. Would that still be considered equity method because of the percentage of the shares? The four percent might make it because you might have a, someone on the board of directors at that. This could actually go both ways. If you had, if the four percent actually put someone on the board of directors, which it very well could, uh, it could be equity, but it also could be the fair value method. And one of the things about you, you, and this is about Ford Motor Company in general. I don't know if you guys know about it, but Ford uh, Ford Motor Company, the Ford family, has certain shares that have all the voting rights, and then everyone else gets. The other shares, you know, they still pay dividends and all that, but they don't have as much voting rights. So the Ford family controls Ford, um, whereas the rest of the people, you know, they still get they still get dividends and all that kind of stuff, but they don't actually control uh, the company. The Ford family does. And again, this four percent, it really depends on how that's worked out. Uh, if if it is influential, it'd be an equity method, but it very well could be not influential, and that you know. If you think about it, in the end, uh, whatever the Fords want to do, they want to do. I, I didn't put that in here. Well, you wouldn't know this from reading this, but yeah. Well, and another thing too, though, is the Ford investments. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're it's a family, so you, you never know how that's going to split. Okay. Uh, purchase 30% of the outstanding shares of the Peabody stock as a short-term investment. Management intends to sell the investment when it the stock price reaches $80 per share. Which method most likely? Would that still be the equity method? Because it's hard to say when it would eat, reach that $80 per share. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be equity method. And even if it is uh, short term, a lot of times if they do make specific plans to sell it, if there's a specific time, 
you can switch it from the equity method to the fair value method. And they do that. It, it, it does happen that they will reclassify it because it'd be misleading on the financial statements. But um, yeah, un, until there's a specific time that it's going to be sold by in that, uh, you use the equity method. And that's like you say, who knows when it's going to reach 80. It may never reach 80. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we're just going to do a little bit of cleanup here, and that is just kind of um, interest income and for debt securities and dividend income from equity securities. <clears throat> In any investment, you basically make money two different ways. One, one, one is that the investments usually throw off cash. So if you buy bonds, they give you interest. And then at the end of the life, they'll pay you back you know, the principal for the bond. So you get interest streams coming in the cash throughout the life, like let's say the next five years, and then they'll pay off the entire month. Stocks, they don't pay interest. It's not a debt security, so they pay dividends. And those, you get, so you get dividends oftentimes if they do, if they pay the dividends, you get dividends, that's cash coming in every year, sometimes twice a year, sometimes four times a year. And then hopefully, you know, when you buy a stock, the stock price goes up. And when it gets up high, you sell it. So you buy it low and you sell it high and you make money that way too. So, and, that, and that's more along the lines of the equity securities. Debt securities, they change in value a little bit. You, you generally don't get rich off of bonds. You get a nice steady income. It, has it happened? Yeah, it's happened. But it's, they're very, um, usually they're very, you know, uh, the market price does not usually change. It doesn't double in price overnight, you know, that's, that's sort of. Whereas stocks, a lot of times they'll go up or down quite a lot. And so a lot of times the dividends may not even be that important, but you know, the value of the stock going up and down is more than bringing money out of them. Okay, so how do you calculate those things? So that's what we're gonna cover here. We should have this down below. By the way, this is a <laughs> this is a fairly new handout. Um, it's a handout that had grown terribly long. I decided to trim it up a little bit. Okay, so how much interest income would they have? They have a hundred thousand dollar bond that yields eight percent purchased on blah blah blah. Okay, so. Hundred thousand times the interest is eight, and how much interest income would be accrued? Okay, and then, oh wait, this is important. I almost went right over that. They purchased it on October 1st, and we're at December 31st. So how many months went by? Three. Uh, yeah, October, November, December, so that would be three. That is 12. Two thousand. So they would make two thousand on the uh, their investment. That would be the interest income, I should say. And so they would recognize it as uh, 2000 of income in 2023. Okay, let's go to dividend income from equity securities.
just bored myself. All right. Uh, so total shares owned. Uh, 10,000 shares. Yeah, the 75 cents, it looks like dividend. Let me put a zero in front of that. All right, so total shares, uh, 10,000. Dividends per share is Five hundred. So each share will get seventy five cents. Hey, look at this. I my formatting was wrong compared to the rest of it. Received dividends from a 15% ownership investment in a company that paid 80,000 in dividends. Ah. Ah. All right, so basically we get 15% uh, of the dividends. So dividends were 80,000. Uh, 15%, go all the way down here. What is that? 12,000? Guess we don't need to go that far down. So sometimes you just, you know, you can just do it by the percentage of ownership. Yeah, 15% of it, you get 15% of the dividends. And all of these on this page, uh, the interest income and the dividend income, those are all cash. You know, this is going to be cash coming in. This is going to be cash coming in. So this is actually cash showing up uh, in the mail usually for correct deposit or something, possibly right in your uh, account. Um, so these are going to be cash coming in. Okay. Okay, realized gain on uh, realized versus unrealized gain. All right. I think it should be down here, but it should be down below. Hold on. I think I'm using the wrong order. Yeah. It probably doesn't matter too much. <laughs> All right. Sold investments that cost $40,000 for $43,000 cash on April 1st. No, April 3rd. What is the amount of realized gain or loss on the sale? All right. now you guys, I'm sure, can do this in your head, but cash received. Forty three thousand minus the cost of the investment, we paid forty thousand for it. And that will equal our three thousand dollar gain. So 
so you sold it or yeah, sold it for more than we paid for it. Okay, what would the general entry look like? What would the accounts be? One of the accounts would be obvious. What did we get? So it would be the cash, the, yep. the gain. Ooh, wait a minute. Yep, so cash asset going up. So we got 43,000. Uh, we would have a gain on the sale. Three thousand. And then we would take off the investment that we sold. That's an asset going down. So we had a $40,000 asset on the books where we sold it. We're glad we sold it. We made money selling it, but we sold it. So the investment of 40000 goes down. The cash goes up to 43000 And we made a gain on the sale of 3000 And, and by the way, this could be for any investment. Any investment that you sold, you'll have this, you know, whether it's the equity method, whether it's the um, fair value method, or even the consolidation method would be the same thing. It's taken off the books as an investment. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Here's the one that's a little bit more, um, let's see, troublesome, but a little bit more uh, theoretical, shall we say. The one thing I have it in the wrong order again. Okay, and that is unrealized gains and losses. No actual sale has occurred. So we haven't sold these items, this, uh, this uh, whatever this investment is. The company's still holding it. So we have this investment as a carry value of 57,000. Now the market value went down to 52,000 at year end. Now, again, we have not sold this. Okay, so we'll have a market value of 52,000. Minus the carry value of 57,000. So what is that, negative 5,000? So is that a gain or a loss? Be considered a loss. Yeah. Okay, so this is where journal entries get a little bit strained. Now you'll notice up here the gain was a credit, so you can imagine the loss is going to be a debit. This is going to be an unrealized loss. Of 5,000. So unrealized, we actually did not sell. When you see unrealized loss on the financial statements or any other place else, that means they haven't sold it yet. Now the market price has gone down. 
but they haven't actually sold it yet. And we need another account. And this account is going to kind of keep track of these gains and losses. Because remember, you know, these investments, we might hold these investments for five years, 10 years. And, you know, going down one year may not have anything to do with it. You know, we don't, you may not worry about that at all because you're going to hold on to it for 10 years or whatever. So the account that we're going to use is called the fair value adjustment account. Oops. Often referred to as, well, first of all, not, not spelled like that. Correct. The FBA, fair value adjustment account. And this account is an asset. And in this case, it's going down. Where it's reducing the assets by it's kind of it, it can be a contra account in this case it, it ends up being a contra account but it can also be a um, a regular asset account because it can go up you know if this was a gain that would, fair value investment account would adjust it up yeah. So in this case, it's reducing our assets, it's going to, assets going down by 5,000, and we're gonna have an unrealized loss. And again, up here, you know, I should probably put that in this realized gain up here to make it kind of, um, kind of distinguish between the two. So this is a realized gain, we actually sold it. Down here, we did not sell it. So this is not sold. And so when you look at financial statements is that when you see things that are unrealized, it means that they're still holding on to it. They have not sold those things. You know, they didn't they didn't have 52,000 of cash coming in. They didn't lose 5,000 of cash or whatever, however you want to put it. Okay, so we're uh, I am going to stop here because these are going to be a little more involved. Let's, let's stop here and take a break. Here we go. Uh, no, let's see. Be back. I'm sorry. We're, we're going to keep doing this one. Be back at, say, 7.02, how about?
Okay. Uh, been a late. So this is kind of going through a um, a little more involved. So here's fair value securities, non influential. <clears throat> Fair all the state journal entries for the following transactions. Okay. February 13th. Oops, that's not February. Ten thousand shares of VTR, BRT, excuse me, were purchased for seven dollars per share. Okay, so this is gonna be an investment. Uh, fair value. You just put FV to this. All right. So let's see. Ten thousand times seven. What is it? Seventy thousand. Um, you know, I'm gonna condense this a little bit. Actually, I'm just gonna put FV, uh, and then I'm gonna put the, this is a. Um, Asset going up. Uh, so many thousand. Okay, uh, what's going on the other side? What did we probably use to purchase that? Awesome. Cash. Yep. <laughs> okay, so cash. Asset going down. So right when we make this investment, we're really not any better or worse off than we were. We simply switched one asset for another. Now we did it because we can probably hopefully make more money on the uh, investment than we can having the cash sit there. Okay, March 31st. Uh, VRT pay dividends of 50 cents per share. So what accounts are we probably gonna use for that? I just realized my, I, I know why this, my account seems so small is because of how big these Debits and credits are way bigger than they need to be. All right, well, so what accounts are we going to use most likely for this? Well, what are they going to pay us with? Cash. cash. All right, so our cash. That's it going up. And they're going to pay us 50 cents per share. We have 10,000 shares. I'm going to put a zero in front of it. We got a few corrections to make on this thing. All right, so what is that, 5,000? I think it's 5,000. Okay, and we're going to have some kind of... Um, Uh, dividend revenue or dividend income. And I am going to cheat and look up here and see what I called it up here. Dividend income. Okay. Just to keep it consistent.
Living income is going up by five thousand. Uh, this next one, I'm going to add a row to it. Actually, I should add two rows to it. The heck was I thinking? I'm not sure. Uh, June 1st, 2,000 shares of VRT stock were sold for $6 per share. Okay, so we sold 2,000 shares of it. <clears throat> And I am going to insert two rows here. And I apologize for that being on yours. Okay. So one of the accounts we're gonna we sold these, so we're gonna we sold two thousand that one for six dollars. So we, we're gonna have cash. We're going to cash it down to six dollars or twelve thousand. Okay, well, uh, what did we pay for these? So wouldn't we put a loss on there and then put the investment account on there also? So the investment account. Okay. Uh, we paid seven dollars a share for these, so we're going to take them off at seven dollars a share. Fourteen thousand, and yes, we'll have a loss. On this, we paid fourteen thousand for these shares. We sold them for twelve. Okay, so this would be a realized. Oops. So we paid seven for them. We sold them for six. We have a loss of two thousand. July 20th, we sold the remaining shares of VTR, excuse me, VRT stock. We're sold for $8 per share. And again, I'm going to add a couple of rows here. So, what would the journal entry for that one be? That would be cash, a gain, 
and then the investment. All right, so we would have care. I'm going to copy this. Copy all of this. See, I'm teaching you guys how to be lazy. Okay, so how many shares we have left? 8,000. Yep. So we have 8,000 shares left. We're selling them for $8 each. Sixty four hundred? No, sixty four thousand. This thing. Okay. Uh, the investment would be eight thousand seven dollars. Six thousand. Yeah, I guess I don't need two commas there. So that uh, so fifty six thousand, and so yeah, this would be a gain. Just say a real life gain. Of eight thousand. So these are all realized gains here. These are, you know, we actually sold this these shares of stock and, you know, the cash went out when we bought it, the cash came back in when we sold it, the transactions are done. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's the same thing. Yeah, we'll do it. Oh, wait, this one's a little bit different. There's a little twist of this one. Okay, uh, March 1st, 10,000 shares, no, 1,000 shares to 24, so this would be. All right, so we bought the investment for $24 per share. Uh, May 21st. Uh, we sold for $21 a share.
right. So what would the cash be? Come on, I don't even know myself. So how much cash would they get? Twelve six. Medium. Yeah, so we would have oops. Six hundred contacts. So this is how much cash we would get. Take the investment off the books at twenty-four thousand. No, twenty-four dollars each, not twenty-four thousand. Fourteen four. Fourteen four. Thank you. All right. Uh we have a loss of eighteen hundred. Oops. All right, this woman, July 1st, uh, AXM paid dividends of I thought I was going to sneeze. All right, uh, they paid dividends of $1.25 per share. Now be careful on this one. Uh, so they got cash. How much cash did they actually get? Uh, dollar twenty-five on four hundred shares. Yep. Good. They no longer have a thousand shares. They only have four hundred. They sold six hundred of the shares. So this will be. Five hundred, yeah. Yep. Sorry, Vermont. Okay, and so this would be. Oops, that again. So dividend income would be 500 also. Okay, so when you're doing these problems, make sure you, you know, whenever they sell something, you adjust the amount of shares. You get, I mean, you guys probably did a, um, Cut it from the other angle and you're in your uh, accounting 210 class. It was a, you know, for the company paying out dividends. Day 123, the remaining AX shares are sold for $28 each. Okay, I'm going to insert a couple rows. Here I am teaching you how to be lazy. Very important skill to know. All right, so they had 400 shares left. They sold them at 28. It's going to be a gain, I think. Uh, 
All right, 400 times 28. Eleven thousand two hundred, and the cost was ninety six hundred. Sixteen hundred. I have a realized gain on the sale of sixteen hundred. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to call it a rel's eye. Okay, well, <clears throat> so these are all realized sales. These are I mean, kind of what we normally would think of when you talk, talk about whether you're making money or on, you know, owning shares of stock and all that. Coming down here, we're gonna start looking at the unrealized gains and losses. Now they start out the same purchasing. So these would be same as we did before. So September 18th, what is No, no, no. Uh, going up. Okay, thousand shares. It's not exactly the same as you did before. Okay, now, so we bought 64,000 worth of investment. The market price per share of ZZT stock is $61 per share. Now, notice we did not sell these. There's no cash involved in this. So this is where we'd use that unrealized loss of uh, fair value adjustment. Yep. So this investment was not sold. All right. All right, so what basically you're gonna do is compare the uh, market price to the carry value, in this case, what we paid for it, which was $64 a share. I guess we need a date in here. 
Okay. So we will have um the market value was Sixty-one thousand. The carry value or book value, either one. I think I use carry value. Sixty-four thousand. So if you subtract that out, all of these, see them. Okay, so this would be an unrealized loss of. Three thousand. Now again, we did not sell these. We're not. We're not going to take this investment off the books. We still have the investment. So what we're going to do is recognize this unrealized loss and make a fair value adjustment. Hey, I'm not doing capitalism anymore. What happened? There we go. <laughs> really looks bad on this that big. All right. Unrealized loss and um, for a value adjustment. The fair value of, oops, too many D's in there. Yeah, the fair value adjustment, yeah, and it's it's similar to a contra account, but it can actually add to the account too. But it um yeah, somebody's called an FBA account. Oops. Uh, and this is an asset. And in this case, the asset's going down. So yeah, this would be a, a, a contra account to the um, investment account. And actually on the next page, I think I show how to do that. I believe. Yeah, so this, now it can, but again, this can also add to it. So it's it, it's sort of like a, um, if if it reduces it, it would be contra to the uh, investment account. If it adds to it, it would be a complement account. <laughs> but you can go either way, be a plus or minus. Whereas whereas some things can only be minuses. For instance, bad debt expense. You know, if you have um, accounts receivable, you don't think you're going to collect or uncollectible account expense. Those are always going to be negative. They're always going to go against the accounts receivable. Whereas this one. If there's a loss, it can go against the accounts receivable. Gotcha. If there's a loss, it can go against the investment account. But if there's a gain, it'll actually add to it. <clears throat> so this one can actually go either way. And so, that, yeah, again, this loss is unrealized, but uh, we count it as a loss. The value of this dropped by 3000 
Okay. Um, same thing for this. Okay, so this is an investment account going, no, not doing anything yet. <laughs> it's from journal entry. Uh, December 31st. Oh, wait a minute, I don't need to make extra accounts for this. What am I doing? Uh, this is what I should be copying down here. Okay, so we had a thousand times five is the carry value we had. Hey, that's not the market. I'm sorry. Uh, the market price was fifty uh, five dollars and thirty cents. The carry value was four dollars and seventy five. So this will be an unrealized gain of five fifty. Oh, not that much. All right. So this one is going to have a fair value adjustment account that actually adds to the um, the investment. So this is going to be a fair value adjustment account. It's going to be an asset going up by 550. And we are going to have an un unrealized gain So in this case, the fair value adjustment would increase the uh, investment account. These two will be added together. I gotta look at something here. How many more of these do I have? Oh boy. I'll tell you what, we'll do one more and then we'll call it a night. Okay.
Fertility treatment. Five hundred shares of HHX were purchased for thirty dollars a share. Date in there, January twenty eighth. Feel free to copy that, copy and paste that. Obviously, hopefully you guys are probably already doing it. I don't know why I'm saying it. Okay, 500 shares. Fifteen thousand. It's fifteen thousand. And you don't need to put this asset plus and minus stuff in there. I just put that in there so that we know how I came up with that was the credits. I mean, this is not actually part of the account. Okay. March 4th. Credit dividend. He wants to share. So we had 500 shares times 40 cents. Did an income for two hundred. Some fifteen sold the shares. Two hundred shares of stock, thirty-two dollars a share. Investment would be two hundred, and we paid uh, thirty dollars for them. Oops.
Okay, so what do we have here? This is a gain. Good. Realized or unrealized? Realized. Four hundred. I try to realize. Gain. You don't have to put it. If you just go to realize gain, it's fine. So we actually sold. So we actually, this is actually cash coming in. You know, we paid 6000 We got back 64 Okay. At year end, the market price per share of HHX stock is $22 per share. Cheat. Okay, uh, how many shares of stock do we still have left? Three hundred. Yeah, we had five hundred. We sold two hundred, so we're down to three hundred shares. Uh, the market value was twenty-two dollars a share. We paid thirty dollars a share. We sold some of them. Okay, so 300 times 22 is what, 6,600? Two thousand four hundred dollars. Let me know check that. Ah. Yeah, twenty four hundred. Okay, so this would be unrealized loss. All right, so this will look like this. Um, the fair value, scratch it. The um, unrealized loss would be twenty four hundred. That fair value adjustment will be the asset going down. And again, feel free to abbreviate that as just uh, FBA. You see it all, all the time. And this is an asset going down. 2400 it's reducing our assets by 2400 and now again we, we haven't sold those 200 shares or 300 shares we still have them okay so coming down here so this is how the balance sheet would look sorry my kind of got goofed up here Boom. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna eliminate you. Okay, so this is what it looked like, and um, it, it would be either be in the current assets section if we were gonna sell these, you know, shortly. If we're gonna hold on to them for a longer period of time, and again, this is all has to do with management intent. What is their intent? Which I know is, sounds kind of funny, but we do. That's how we classify them. Um, <clears throat> so the fair value of the investment securities. Carry value is 9,000. Let me 
whatsoever. Uh, the fair value adjustment would be a reduction of 2,400. And so we would have the net would be the 6,600, which is what you'd expect because that's the market value. So this is the way this would be shown on the um, balance sheet. Again, it would be either either of one of these accounts, depending on how, how long management wanted to hold on to it for. The investment account is for long-term investments. And so this is the amount that you would show on there. And you know, realizing that unlike a lot of other accounts, a lot of like a lot of other assets, if they're actively traded, you can, you know, get a pretty accurate number as far as what these the value of these investments are at the end of the year. You just have to look at the go to the Wall Street Journal, whatever, look at see what the final price was, final paid for an investment. Um Use that as your fair value. And this is the way, so this is how it'd be shown on the balance sheet. Question on that? Let's stop here. Kind of a dry hand out a little bit. But, but it's good stuff. And, and, and I think that um, if, if you actually look at a company's financial statements, there are some companies that their their investments are far more than their operating assets. There are some companies that are, you know, conglomerates that, that you know they their investments are pretty much their their whole business. Okay. Uh, oh, geez. Stop with that. What do I do? I do something here. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm not sure what I did here. <laughs> I guess we'll say have a good, good night to everybody. All right. Uh, I, I don't think the... Um, Uh, I don't know what I do here. <laughs> Big head on the screen. All right. Uh, I think we have the um. I think the, uh, what uh. The only thing we have to turn in. Uh, the chapter thirteen exam is due this Friday. Nothing from the, this handout. We're not done with this handout, so we won't do that. And uh, I'll say good night. My big giant head taking up the entire screen. Okay, uh, so I will see you guys in a week. All right. Have a good night, Professor. Good night, good night Professor. Mm -hmm.